Before we jump into God's word this morning, I wanted to start off by uh, asking you to consider something. Uh, and it's two appeals, and it has nothing to do with money. Um, for those of you who've been coming to Southridge for a while, you'll know that we have, or we're connected to a camp called Camp Quanos. It's our camp that we support. And many of you send uh, your kids there during the summer. And we have sent many young adults uh, and teens there to serve as counselors, to learn leadership and that. And I got an email from Scott, the director, on Friday. And this is the first time I've ever received a, an email like this from him. He said, Brent, if you could do me a favor, uh, could you talk to your church on Sunday? Uh, those of you who are, are familiar with Qantas will know that they have a number of international kids that come in to serve as counselors, usually for the whole summer. And this year, for some reason, uh, quite a few of them have been denied entry visas. In fact, uh, right now, they're looking at maybe 20 of them not coming. Uh, because for whatever reason, the government isn't uh, approving their visas and they're frustrated because uh, some kids get approved and another, another uh, young adult does the, exactly the same thing and gets denied. And so there really is no understanding as to why they're going through this, but it has left them quite short-staffed uh, for the summer. And so the appeal, because over the summer, Qantas has over 4,000 kids that come through its doors over 400 a week. And many of those children, many of those kids don't go to church, don't come from church families, and they see hundreds of kids accept Christ every summer uh, through the ministry of Camp Quanos. And so they're saying, hey, we're in desperate need of volunteers to come and help serve. They need about 180 people a week to pull off camp. And so what they're asking for is if God lays it on your heart, even if it's for a week this summer, you go, I can't give the whole summer, that's great. Even if it's for, for a week, would you consider going? And they need help uh, in terms of in the kitchen, whether it's cooking, dish pit, dish crew. They need janitorial help, maintenance help. Yes, they need counseling, counselors for being in the cabins with the kids. But they've got a whole variety of, of areas where they need. So really, any skill set, they can take. You just need to have a willing heart. So if God speaks to you about maybe going to Quanos uh, for a week or longer, uh, you can talk to me after the service, or if you've been connected to Quantus, you know how to get a hold of them. So please consider that. The other appeal that I want to bring before you is our soccer camp. It is a couple of weeks away, and soccer camp is the biggest event that, as a church, we do all, every year. Uh, and this year, I think, is probably going to be our biggest camp ever. We have 225 kids in the main camp, which is ages 5 to 10. We have 60 kids in the mini camp, which is kind of the daycare age. And we have 50 junior coaches. And so we're running a little short on uh, coaches this year for our main camp and our mini camp. And now a, a number of people signed up after the first service, uh, but we still need about, I think it's five coaches for the main camp and seven coaches for the mini camp. We actually have a wait list right now for our main camp. And so without coaches, we can't add any more kids uh, because we just don't have the coaching space for them. So maybe if, you'd, if God lays it on your heart, maybe you, this would be your first year at camp. It is an amazing experience. Uh, we see God work in amazing ways through soccer camp. Maybe it would be your fifth or 10th or maybe even 20th year of doing soccer camp. Uh, and you thought, no, I, I'm going to sit this one out. Maybe God will speak to you and say, hey, no, I think you need one more year. Uh, and so if that's the case... Uh, go and talk to John after the service. He'll be at the Southridge Kids table. He'll gladly talk to you about what he needs. And even if you can only come for a couple of days, sometimes we rotate coaches in and out of teams, even if they can only serve one or two days a week just to help the main coach uh, with the kids and stuff. So I leave that with you. But I thought I would pray for those two things and because I believe God answers prayer and I know God answers prayer. So let me pray. Dear Only Father, we bring before you Quanos and our soccer camp. God, these are amazing events that your people put on. And we see kids come to faith. We see kids accept you because of the efforts of your church. And so, Lord, I pray that you would provide for Quanos in this need that they have. I pray that you provide for us in this need that we have. And I look forward already to hearing the stories after this summer is done of how you've moved in kids' lives at soccer camp and at Quanos. And so, Lord, we praise you right now for how you're going to answer these prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Talking about that reminds me that as the church, God has called us to be on mission. And God has asked us to do certain things and live certain ways. And that's what I want to spend some time thinking about this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 11 this morning. And so just let me read those verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you about Uh, For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and all children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. I want to start with what Paul ends there in verse 11. And that is the the command, the encouragement to encourage and build each other up. In essence, what Paul is saying here, I believe, is that encouragement for the church is not an option. We do not have the option of not encouraging other brothers and sisters in Christ. We do not have the option of not building each other up. I really do believe that encouragement is the secret weapon of the church. It is a weapon that if we use it to its full potential, will build up the church, will help the church move forward and accomplish what God wants us to accomplish. And yet, because encouragement is so easy, we sometimes look at it and we don't do it. We think, oh, why, does, why do I need to tell that person that? They already know that. Why should I tell them this? They already know that, don't they? I'm sure someone else has told them that. I can't be the only person, God, that you want me to speak into their life about. But the reality is, each and every one of us need encouragement at some point in our walk, at some point in our week, at some point in our year. You see, we need encouragement because it does build us up. It does help us take that next step. It helps us move forward. And the reality is when we encourage someone, it never just stops at the person we encourage. Encouragement is a gift that gets passed on once we start giving it away. So when we encourage someone, they in turn usually encourage someone else because they themselves have been encouraged. And so if you want to have an incredible impact on our church, just start encouraging people. The sad reality is that for when churches start to have conflict in them, one of the first things that goes is encouragement. When we start getting mad at each other, when we start nitpicking each other, when we start arguing with each other, the first thing out the window usually is encouragement, isn't it? We stop encouraging each other. Paul comes along, though, and says to these Christians, These Thessalonians, look guys, encouragement is so important, it is not an option. I'm commanding you to encourage each other. If you were here last week, we looked at the end of chapter four. He finishes chapter four the same way. Encourage one another. Apparently, Paul really wanted to get this message across to people. Encourage one another. And as I look at this passage, I think there's three things that Paul wants to encourage us with. There are three aspects of encouragement that he wants to remind us. And the first one, which is found in verses 1 to 3, is this. Paul is encouraging us not to get sidetracked. What do those verses say? Those verses talk about days and times, about when Jesus is coming back. This is the carryover from the end of chapter four. He's talking about the day of the Lord coming like a thief in the night. He's talking about people saying peace and safety. 
I don't know if you noticed, but uh, if you were paying attention to the news, but a little while ago, Fox News carried a story. And uh, they said, they reported that the end of the world was coming on April 23rd. Apparently, I missed that. I don't know about you. Apparently, you missed it as well. But in the article that they were carrying, in their news report, they were saying, they quoted a prominent Christian numerologist by the name of David Mead. And David Mead had worked it out based on Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, that the end of the world was coming on April 23rd, 2018. And you may ask, well, how did he know that that was the case? Well, let me tell you. In the article, it goes on to say this. So Revelations 12, 1 to 2 says this. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant, and she was crying out in birth pains and the, and the agony of giving birth. He looks at this passage, and he tells the newspaper that he understands that the woman in Revelation 12 is the constellation Virgo. And, according to Mead, that when everything lines up, it's going to be like this. The lion of the tribe of Judah, which is the, now the nation of Israel, and the rapture, when all the Christians get called up to be with Jesus, and the belief that Christ will bring all this to pass prior to the tribulation that precedes the end of time, he told the UK Daily Express that the sun appears to precisely clothe Virgo on April 8th. 2018. And the planet Jupiter is birthed on that day as well. You see it coming through the constellation. And then when you get to April 23rd, this is what happens. The moon appears under the feet of the constellation of Virgo, if you're looking into the night sky. And on that day, the 12 stars, which are uh, the stars of Leo, the nine stars of Leo, plus the three planets of Mercury, Venus, and Mars, they will appear uh, as a crown on the constellation of Virgo. And thus, the constellations of Leo and Virgo line up in this once-in-a-century sign that depicts Revelation chapter 12. And therefore, April 23rd, 2018, is the end of the world. Now, I don't know how many times you have heard that the end of the world is coming, but I can give you this with 100% certainty. That every person that believes that they know the exact date of when the world is going to end is wrong. They've always been wrong. Time and time again, as you look at our history, especially over the last couple hundred years, people will stand up, men and women will stand up and say, I know when the end of the world is coming. I can give you the date. I can tell you the time when, that, when the end of the world is coming. And every single time, they've been wrong. And Paul is reminding them, is encouraging them, don't get sidetracked on worrying about when Jesus is coming back, because that's the focus of the end of chapter 4. He says, look, there are dates and times. You don't need to worry about it. And there's two different words used in the original language here. Times meaning a chronological aspect. That, yes, God has a chronological plan. That, yes, God has a plan when Jesus will return. There is a time limit, and we're marching towards it. And there is dates. Some translations translate the word that we get date in the new uh, NIV as seasons. And there's this, this aspect, this qualitative aspect that most uh, commentators understand that there are events that need to occur before the end comes. So yes, there is time, the passage of days and months and years, but there are also events that need to take place. But Paul is saying, don't worry about it. Don't get sidetracked worrying about when Jesus is coming back. Just realize and know in your heart of hearts, he's coming back one day. Don't get sidetracked. He goes on in verse 3 to talk about, hey, when culture, when society, when our nations of this world talk about peace and safety, and they celebrate what they believe has arrived, don't be lulled into a false sense of security. Because you know it's not going to end that way. If you know your history at all, 
Paul is writing during the Roman Empire period, and one of the slogans that the Roman Empire had was peace and safety. It was kind of a thing they told people, especially when they were going in to conquer a nation. Hey, why don't you just submit, and we will guarantee peace and safety for your people. That was the big thing that they wanted. And so you can almost hear Paul writing these words saying, don't buy into what culture is telling you. Don't buy into what the government says here, that yes, peace and safety, everything's going to turn out well for us. As believers, we know that the end of time is coming. And Paul uses a phrase here, the day of the Lord. When the day of the Lord is used in scripture, it always refers to judgment. And it is a reminder that Paul is telling them that one day when Jesus returns, there also comes the judgment of God on people. And as Christians, if you read the rest of the passage like we did, you realize that we don't have to be worried about the day of the Lord. We don't have to be worried about judgment because we have received what? Salvation. We are not appointed to wrath, he'll say later on, but instead for salvation. So yes, as Paul is telling them, don't get sidetracked worrying about dates and times that Jesus come back. Don't get sidetracked with this false promise that peace and security is going to last. Just understand, Jesus is going to come back. It's going to be at a time when our world does not expect it. But you will because you know what to look for. Just don't get sidetracked. Don't worry about it because you have your salvation. So he encourages us not to get sidetracked. But he goes on, I think, in verses 4 to 8 to talk about two other things that he wants to encourage us this morning with. And the second thing is, be spiritually sober. The words here that he uses for are awake and sober. Be mentally alert to what is going on in our culture. Be mentally alert to what is going on in your world. Be mentally alert to what is going on in your life. And not only that, be sober, be self-controlled, as it's translated sometimes. Control yourself. Don't give in to excesses. And he contrasts it and compares it with the world and how they act. If they're living in darkness, they get drunk. And part of the imagery of getting drunk is losing control. And he says, as children of light, we're not to lose control. We're to be sober-minded. We're to be alert to what is going on. We are to understand what God wants for us, not just chasing after whatever we want. What he's telling us is, is that light is to be a distinguishing characteristic of God's children. And he contrasts those who are God's and those who are not as light and darkness. This past week, um, I was talking to one of the guys in the church, and he was sharing with me, he just got, him and his wife had just gotten back from a trip to Italy. And he was talking about how they had gone to Venice. And I've never been to Venice, but he was sharing, and I, I kind of want to go now after he was t- telling me his stories. But he was, they were on this tour in Venice to the Doge's Palace. And this palace is a beautiful palace. But part of what you see when you go to the Doge's Palace is that it's connected to a prison, and what really caught his attention was what the, gar- the guide said about the prison. And the guide was pointing out the prison and, and talking about how on the, the top level of the prison were these uh, cells, but each cell had a, a small window. And the guide went on to say that that was the best place. If you were a prisoner, you wanted to be on the top floor with these windows because what those windows gave you was air, fresh air, And more importantly, light. And the guide said that as a prisoner, light is a luxury. You see, every level below the top level and even into, you know, the dungeon area, every other cell had no windows. They were pitch black cells. And the guide finished off their little explanation of the prison by saying this. You know what happens to people when they get put? in a cell with no light for a length of time. They go insane. I went, wow. (laughs) So I thought I'd do a little more research on that and see if it's true. I came across this study done in Britain in 2008. Some scientists um, 
got some volunteers, six volunteers actually, to voluntarily go into isolation for 48 hours. That meant that they would go into a room that had no sound, no light, all they would get is some meals. No time, no clocks, pitch black, nothing. They would observe them through, you know, cameras, night vision cameras and stuff. And um, one of the guys uh, that went through this study was interviewed in the Daily Mail. And so he was sharing his experience of having to go through this 48 hours of total isolation. And he shared that in our, for the first part, it wasn't too hard. He was, you know, like singing and talking to himself and all that kind of stuff. And then he had a nap and everything was going okay. And then, and he didn't know the timelines. They told him later on. But what he found was that by the 18th hour, he was starting to suffer from paranoia. Just 18 hours into this experiment. He started having these thoughts like, are, is this really an experiment? Are they really watching me? Maybe they've lied to me and they've all gone home. And I'm here by myself. He went on to talk about how he started singing after that. And then all of a sudden in the middle of song, he just broke down and started weeping for no reason. Just started to lose it. 24 hours in, almost all of the six uh, people, they observed their mental alertness just took a nosedive. They could not stay awake and be sober. <laughs> By the 30th hour, most of them started pacing for no reason. They just got up and started walking in their room back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, pacing endlessly. By the 40th hour, many of them started hallucinating. The guy said he saw this huge pile of oyster shells in his room. Other people had other experiences. By the end of it, he was so glad to be out of it. In the 50s, in Canada, there was an experiment that was similar to this. They ran an experiment where they asked for volunteers, but they didn't have an end date, like an end time. They were just putting them in isolation and seeing and observing what was going on. Most of the people that volunteered for this study couldn't go past 48 hours. In fact, the professor, Donald Hebb, who oversaw the thing, made this comment, the very identity of the subjects began to disintegrate within two days. Their very being their very identity started to fall apart within 48 hours of having no light, being completely in darkness. We are children of light. If our bodies react this way with the absence of light, and they break down physically, they break down emotionally, they break down mentally, think about what happens spiritually when we live in darkness. How do we spiritually handle darkness? <laughs> for some of you, you've been Christians for a long time, maybe years, maybe decades, and you maybe have forgotten what it was like to live in spiritual darkness. The reality of fear, the reality of despair, the reality of not having hope. Paul comes along and he says, look, I want to encourage you. Don't get sidetracked on useless discussions. I want to encourage you to be spiritually sober, to understand what life is really like. And I think the third thing he's telling us here is in terms of an encouragement is this, is combat the darkness. As children of light, we are called to combat the darkness. You see, darkness, whether it's a physical thing or a spiritual thing, uh, brings with it fear, despair, and uncertainty. That's what darkness represents. And so what does Paul say? What does Paul tell us in terms of an encouragement? Apparently, his favorite trilogy is not New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, or Return of the Jedi. 
Paul's favorite trilogy in this thing is faith, hope, and love, right? He uses that trilogy numerous times in the New Testament. And in this passage, he says it again. What does he say in verse 8? Putting on faith and love as, as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Why would he tell us this after talking about light and darkness? Why does he think these things are the important things that we need to encourage each other with, to be reminded of? I think there's some really simple things here. What does faith do? Faith is the thing that shines in the darkness. You see, because when we understand faith, it directs us towards God. That's what faith is. It is an understanding of what, who God is and understanding of how much he loves us and what he's done for us. And when we are filled with faith, we combat the darkness by shining as a light. And so Paul tells us, don't forget to put on faith. And then he comes along and he says, don't forget the other thing, love. Why is love important? Why is it important to focus on love? The Bible tells us this, perfect love casts out what? Fear. What does darkness bring? Fear. So Paul comes along and says, look, faith will direct you to God. Remember to put that on. And love will direct you to others to remind you of what God has called you to do. We express it simply as a church at Southridge, as our mission, to love God. That's the faith piece. And to change this world one life at a time, that means directing love towards others. That is what God is calling us to do. Notice what he says. What does a breastplate do when you put it on? It protects your heart, doesn't it? I think Paul is reminding us that it is faith and love that speak to our heart, that allow us, allow our heart to be protected. Because when the darkness comes and surrounds us, it tries to impact our heart. It tries to take the very will of our life away. And the way we combat that is by instilling and reminding ourselves of the faith we have in God and the love we need to have for each other. But Paul doesn't stop there. What else does he say? He says hope. And how does he give you an image of what hope does? Put it on the helmet, right? Hope is the helmet we put on. Hope is so important because hope is the thing that drowns out despair. So when the darkness comes into our life or we're, we're confronted with darkness, one of the things that it is trying to do is cause us to despair. And how do we deal with despair? We have to claim hope. And the reason I think it's a helmet is because what does a helmet protect? Your head, where your mind is. And it is our mind that starts playing tricks on us when we are deprived of light, as the studies have shown. I think it's the same thing with spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness plays tricks on our mind if we don't have the helmet of hope on. Notice what he says, I think, as part of hope. He goes on in verses 9 and 10 to list a couple of things that really instill why hope is so important to us. He tells us that because of the hope in Jesus Christ, we are not destined for wrath, but we are destined for salvation. We've been appointed for salvation because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And that hope comes because Jesus died for us. He says that right there. He died for us, verse 10, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. He's saying the hope that we claim when the darkness surrounds us is this, that we will be with Jesus. That's where our hope is based. That's the foundation of our hope. That because Jesus died for us, because Jesus loves us so much that he died for us and rose again as we looked at last week, chapter four. Died and rose that we can have the hope that we will be with Jesus when the day of the Lord comes and judgment falls on the earth. That's what he's saying there. Our hope comes in understanding that genuine security doesn't come from deadbolts on our door or gates in front of our house. It comes in knowing that Jesus has us, that he's got us in his hands, and no one can take, us, take that away. What is Paul saying here? I think what Paul is trying to tell us is that we will live differently when we are spiritually sober. 
We, as children of light, live differently than the world because we are spiritually sober. We understand that we are called to combat the darkness. We understand that we are not to get sidetracked by things that keep us off mission or take us off mission. We are not to be worried about the future because we see clearly what the future is. We may not know the date and time Jesus is coming back, but we know that he's coming back. We have an eternal perspective. And it should encourage each one of us as we live our life day by day to be spiritually sober, to understand what is really going on in life. I want to share with you something that happened in the earlier service. We had a gentleman come in off the uh, come for the first time to Southridge and one of our greeters started talking to them and it quickly became a very spiritual conversation. So much so that our greeter had the chance and the opportunity and the privilege of praying with that guy to receive Christ this morning. Isn't that amazing? That's awesome. He no longer walks in spiritual darkness. Because he has accepted what Jesus has done for him. We need to live that same way. We need to encourage each other that same way. Not to get sidetracked with things that don't count eternally. Not to forget to live spiritually sober lives and never give up combating the darkness in our world. Because our world's only hope is the church. Our world's only hope is us doing what God has called us to do. That is why we serve at soccer camp. That is why we serve at Quanos. That is why we tell our neighbors about Jesus. That is why at work we are willing to be the vehicle, the witness that God wants us to be to share with others who are in spiritual darkness, who are in spiritual hopelessness, who are in spiritual despair because they don't know the hope of Jesus. Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, it is a good reminder that we come together on Sundays as a church to encourage one another, to build each other up, to do the things that you have called us to do, to live the mission that you have called us to live as a church, to love you and change this world one life at a time. And Lord, we will only do that when we turn outward, when we live the purpose that you've given each one of us to live, and by doing that, our community, our workplace will experience you. Lord, I encourage us today not to get distracted, not to get sidetracked, but to live spiritually sober lives and to live with a willingness to combat the darkness of this world. In Jesus' name, amen.